Hello and welcome to Dear Franny, the podcast of uncommon conversations about love. I'm your host, Francesca Hoagie. Hello. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that all is well in your world as well as can be given everything that's going on right now. One upside to what's happening is that now when I probably said this already on the podcast because I keep on saying it. (laughs) But one upside I find is that when now when we are asking each other, how are you doing? We're first of all asking very genuinely and not out of kind of social politeness norm obligation and also that people are answering honestly and um, I think there's something really great about that so when I'm sending you good vibes just know that I really mean it I really do and speaking of good vibes today's episode is so many good vibes good vibes galore I am really excited for you to hear this conversation that I had with the very amazing creative inspiring women of the podcast black girls texting and they are I'm going to tell you more about them one by one in our conversation but black girls texting consists of Glenn Pogue, Chelsea Rojas, and Shade Parham, and they are just really amazing and funny, interesting, and smart, and insightful, and cool, and, you know, they are, I kind of feel like they're big sister, and I feel really proud of them, even though I shouldn't, because I don't have anything to do with their amazingness, but I'm really happy that I got the chance to talk to them here on Dear Franny, and in case you missed it, I also was on Black Girls Texting, they interviewed me for their show as well, so we had a really, really great conversation on their show as well so i will be sure to link in the show notes to that episode so you can check that out but without further ado please enjoy my very fun wide-ranging conversation with the amazing women of black girls texting ladies welcome to dear franny i'm so excited to have you here we're so happy to be here this is awesome Um, the episode that when you guys interviewed me was so much fun. And so I'm very excited. So everyone be sure who's listening to this, be sure to check out the black girls texting episode with me. I'm going to introduce each of you and read your bios. Looking at your bios earlier, I was like, oh my God, this makes me feel so old because I could like be all of their moms, but (laughs) (laughs) what? It also makes me so proud of you guys that you were like really doing such amazing things in the world. I feel both ways. Okay, so I'm going to just take this one by one and introduce you ladies. So Glenn, let's start with you. Listeners, born and bred in bed Glenn Pogue tells stories from around the world and around the way. Named one of Brooklyn Magazine's 30 Under 30, the do or die dreamer's writing has been featured in National Geographic Traveler, Vogue, Eater, and Essence, among others. Amazing. Glenn, welcome to Dear Franny. Hi. It's so good to be here. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Oh my God. I'm so happy to have you. And I'm also always happy to meet a fellow native New Yorker. Yes. It's a rare, we're a rare breed. We are a rare breed. So how are you doing right now? I'm doing all right. Um, You know, quarantine life. Every day is different. Today I was like super chilled out, watched a lot of Curb Your Enthusiasm, and it's been really nice. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I'm chilling. I'm chilling. Okay, excellent, excellent. So Chelsea, all right, Chelsea Rojas, born of Trinidadian and Venezuelan descent, 26-year-old Chelsea Rojas is making career moves and shifts while still working on her craft acting, is obsessed with traveling, film, TV, and politics. Hi, Chelsea, welcome to Dear Franny. Hello, so happy to be here. So happy to have you here. How are you doing? I'm good. I have my little tequila and lime. I'm ready to chat. Nice. Okay, good. All right. So everyone has been had has I had know, a little I'm alcohol like... except for Glenn. Glenn, feel free to like run to the kitchen right now and catch up with the rest of us, okay? <laughs> feel free to get on our level. Shade. Hi. Shade Parnum is a 27-year-old Brooklyn native now residing in the Bay Area. Another shout out to Native New Yorker. With a background in fashion and merchandising and marketing, she lives the corporate life but fully believes in a work hard, play hard mantra. Welcome to Dear Franny Shade. I am so excited. (laughs) (laughs) First of all, I just wanted to ask you guys and, you know, any one of you can take this. What is Black Girls Texting about? How do you describe it and how did it come to be? I actually think you're being kind of fun for us to all say a little tidbit if that's okay yeah i'd love that oh awesome okay brainwaves line up (laughs) um 
For me, Black Girls Texting is really a space for us to kind of show Black women, Black people, that there is diversity in Blackness. You know, that it's cool for other people to see as well, but I really don't care about them. It's really for our people to understand that you don't have to fit into a cookie cutter mold. You can like Avril Lavigne and City Girls and like <laughs> have different hobbies and interests and you don't have to be pigeonholed the way that a lot of times you see in media we are. And so, you know, we are fully ourselves. We're all very different. Different, but we're really about representing and also just like being amazing and also being messy. It, it just shows the, the range. Right. It's just the realness, the diversity of the experience of being a black woman. Yeah. And I think, I think also we are having conversations that some people want to have and may not have a person to have those conversations with. So we kind of offer a space to talk about all the things that gals want to talk about. Yeah. And we're called Black Girls Texting because it's based around like the sanctity of our group chat. We have have had this group chat for some years now and we thought we were hilarious and smart and just having all these really interesting conversations. So we took them to the podcasting space first and we have plans for other types of expansions. But the name Black Girls Texting was also chosen because we thought it was interesting just to have Black girls doing something banal, like not Black girls saving the world or like Black girls being excellent or Black girls being magical. It's like Black girls texting. Black girls walking, like we can do all of those things. As Shade mentioned, this like multiplicity. Yes, I love that. Well, first of all, I'm very intrigued by what else, what other ways you're going to expand the Black Girls Texting brand. But we don't have to talk about that right now. But I, I'm, I'm like, oh, that's intriguing. But you also mentioned Black Girl Magic. And I wonder, well, actually, first of all, you guys did a very good job. So I can tell that is the thing for you. <laughs> you guys really hit those points really well. How do you feel about Black Girl Magic? How do you feel? I mean, because I know that I, on the one hand, of course, I'm like so happy for that movement and for that term. But on the other hand, I kind of feel the way you guys feel sometimes where it's like, I don't have to be magical all the time. I can just be a person. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, yeah, is a beautiful thing, but also comes with so much pressure. And I feel like sometimes we are not, especially black women are not like just allowed to be. It's like, it's a lot of, to carry on your shoulders. So, but it's also beautiful because it finally an example that, you know, black girls and blackness and womanhood is special and magical. So it's kind of twofold for me. There's so many things about my identity that I felt so insecure about, specifically as a black girl, I guess at the time. And um, these kinds of messaging, like black girl magic, it's so affirming to me in ways that I didn't know I needed, I guess. And I think especially if I would have been younger, to hear someone say that my hair was magical the way that it is would have been like, so amazing especially like in the mainstream you know like yeah I was hearing this in my household or like my family but like mainstream a little bit more mainstream affirmations so I I, that is why I like it Mm -hmm. as a movement yeah I love it as a movement (laughs) but the older I get the less weird I feel because when I was growing up you know I was born I'm 45 so when I was growing up you know there were very 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 few images of black women in media that were positive or relatable in any way because you were either Mm -hmm. like Iman and you were a supermodel or you were like Whitney Houston and you were like a you know this major superstar or you were like crack mom on the news you know it was like there wasn't a lot and you know the hair and the skin tone and all this stuff so I I'm so happy that now that we are starting to really embrace like yes our hair is beautiful our skin is beautiful all the tones our curves all those things it would have made my life so much easier because I spent so many years struggling with all of that that's so interesting so you're my in my older sister's age so I have all my sisters are much older than me. I was an accident, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you were a welcome surprise, honey. <laughs> but um, I was a welcome surprise. No, I, I totally say that in jest. I have very dark humor, so you guys are gonna learn that about me on the show. I talk to my sisters about that all the time, and my older sister, who like jokes like she's my mom. Watching her raise her four-year-old, I see like so much of the intention behind that, just because of like everything you said when she was growing up. She was like, "You have no idea how." It's like night and day, even though we feel like we grew up in the same like household, the same family, but it's crazy. It's so crazy. It's so crazy. Well, you guys talk a lot about 
dating and relationships mm-hmm. and sex on the podcast. And I talk about those things on my podcast as well. <laughs> and you also give a lot of advice. And I wonder, like, it, you know, you all have obviously your own perspectives and you're coming to the conversation from your own points of view. When you guys are giving advice, I guess, first of all, the first question is maybe like, what's a typical kind of question that people are asking you for advice on, you know, the topics of dating and relationships and sex? And what are the different roles that you occupy? Like, how does like Sade's advice different from Chelsea's from Glenn's? Oh, I love this question. Yeah, I think definitely because we're all in our mid to late 20s. And a lot of our listeners are younger. And I think that a lot of them are in these situations where they're like either in a committed relationship with someone they've been with for a long time and they feel torn about wanting to like live their lives or there's a lot of messy mixed signals people are getting from dudes which I can personally relate with just that are very like quintessential 20 something relationship woes yeah yeah or like women that want to be in relationships and they're wondering like what can I do to kind of change the path that I'm on because it's not seeming to work. Mm-hmm. Yep. I hear that same question a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. But to your second question in terms of like the different, I guess, perspectives that we all have, I think that's the coolest part about us. I think that, I mean, I'll just speak for myself, but I was definitely the person that had a lot of like situationships, very big mixed signal relationships and just was like in the streets I was like I just want to like mess around and sleep around and kind of had like a come to Jesus moment for my own wants and needs and so I tend to come from a perspective of like girl live your life be crazy just get you know like because that's what I did but I also see the perspective of maybe that doesn't align for you but I feel like I tend to be like 22 no you can't be in a serious relationship this is like prime time like your breasts are so high (laughs) (laughs) they're never gonna be this high again Uh -uh. so are you the person then who like because you know everybody has that friend that you go to for Mm -hmm. permission like you know that that friend is gonna co-sign you're gonna you're you're like wait i want somebody on my side here shade are you that person I don't even think they ask. They just know. I'm always going to tell you like, yeah, get chores, but be safe. I was like in early 20s. I literally had a condom in every single purse that I own. And I love purses. I love them. (laughs) I like rotate out my bags like every day. And in every single one, there were condoms. Every single trip we went on, I would bring like two boxes. Because I was like, you never know what happened. Have your fun, but make sure you're safe. And like, don't, you know, we don't want to leave this location with anything we can't get rid of. (laughs) <laughs> hilarious <laughs> chelsea what's your role so i don't like believe in signs that much like except for the fact that i'm a capricorn but according to people <laughs> they say that my venus is in pisces and so i am definitely very like romantic one person kind of girl So it's very different, I think, from like Sade, for example. And I am always going to push for you to find your love. Mm. Oh, you're the romantic of the group. Yeah. Yeah. I I, like psychoanalyze situations and I'm like, hmm, that person did that really foul thing to you. But why did they do that? Like, what are those traumas? Because they said that to you. Maybe it means that like I'm the person that's reading through the like invisible subtext of text messages somebody could say live like word sentence and i'm like mm, yep that means he don't ever want to talk to you again or like not that extreme but like you know <laughs> i love that i feel like i can relate to all three of you and i have definitely been that person in like a different phases of my life and so i fully relate to that i was curious actually what you guys were talking something occurred to me So I interviewed, do you guys know Cameron Glover from Sex, Ed, and Color? That's her podcast. Oh, yeah. I heard that episode. So good. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. And one of the things, so she is a Black queer woman who became a sex educator, and now she actually is a sex educator coach. So she trains other people, or she coaches other people to like 
start their own sex educator business. So we were talking about like sex education and literally like sex ed in school. And she's like around your age. And so it was really interesting to hear the difference between the sex ed I got and the sex ed that she got. So I was curious, what was the sex ed that you guys got? Yeah, I don't know if my memory is also terrible, but I literally don't remember any kind of sex ed being taught at all. I remember having health and I remember they made us watch the basketball diaries. Do you know that movie with Leonardo DiCaprio? Yeah, but why? To like make us not want to like ever try drugs. That was it. And maybe there was some sex in that movie too. I think they were just being like, don't do anything. That was the lesson. I don't remember anything else. (laughs) I'm like, wait, what? I thought we were talking about sex. (laughs) I know we're talking about sex. They're like, this is your sex ed class. Don't do drugs. (laughs) Goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye. (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. I actually do remember sex ed though in high school. And we I think we did like the banana condom thing or maybe i'm making that up from like a movie but i swear oh my gosh. Yeah. i know I like know condoms that. were given out at my school and we talked a lot about it i went to a public school in downtown manhattan and so like we had oh. a lot of cases here and there of like teen pregnancy so it wasn't like a secret it was very open i remember in middle school we watched the miracle of life and so we literally learned about how a baby is born and they actually show it in the end and i just remember all the boys being like ew she's not shaved ew that thing is hairy girl in middle school and everyone like laughing and like yeah that's what i remember (laughs) oh god and then i also remember the period book i was obsessed with getting my period i was obsessed with getting my period too (laughs) (laughs) yeah like when it happened i literally took (laughs) and saved the pictures and my mom was like you are i was so did you guys read judy bloom or was that over by the time you guys were yes okay no definitely that was just always will be a thing so because of judy bloom i was obsessed with getting my period and i taught myself how to use a tampon like three years before i ever got my period because i was just so excited oh my gosh (laughs) the tampon thing was like traumatizing for me i remember i was like only wearing pads and in high school i went to boarding school they were trying to teach me how to put one in and i was like no this hurts it hurts so bad and like for years i didn't wear tampons literally same experience shade you were there when you helped me (laughs) you taught me how to put in a tampon she remembers nothing your first first time how long ago was this how long ago was this? But wait, who just learned how to use a tampon? <laughs> no, 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 no. But I was like, I was like 15 or something. Chelsea, I also yeah, like, I used a tampon my first time. Used tampons. I remember when I got my period, I was like, no. I was like really in denial. I think I just wanted to, I don't know. I think it freaked me out, actually. I was like, oh my God, my mom has been telling me I was going to be a woman when this happened. What does this mean? Uh, (sighs) The tampon thing, I just remember my mom being like, that's for people who are having sex. You don't need to wear a tampon. (laughs) My mom said the same thing, same exact thing. Oh my God. Yeah, no, I totally, it was a whole thing. I remember like having like the box and the directions and Wait, like trial seriously? and error and like figuring it out. I remember being so excited when I finally, I think I probably went through like half a box of tampons trying to figure out how to put it in properly. Stop. Wait, did, did you, why didn't you like ask your mom for help? Probably just because I was like nine and I just wanted to figure it out. I don't know. I don't know. Though actually come to think of it, I don't think my mom really use tampons now that I think about it but my sister did I did have a big sister who I could have asked but I just figured it out on my own yeah I don't know I was I'm an independent kid I guess brain is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably ask any woman like how did you feel about getting her period and it's probably one or the, it's either it was the greatest moment of my life or it was the worst like there's probably no middle ground on that yeah yes I just remember like girls in middle school when everyone started getting their periods whoever like I guess, you know, you're learning how to take care of yourself. So sometimes you would leak like onto your school uniform. And like, if that happened to you, you were done for the rest of the year. Oh, oh girl, I had so many leaks. It was ridiculous. Are you, like, me too. Was, oh my God. I used to have to go to the hospital for cramps. Like it was a whole thing. I actually oh really, man. Really, really I've never had a cramp in my life. Periods. Oh my God. Oh, you're so lucky. Wow. This is so... <laughs> I could ask you like 10 more questions about your period, but I guess... <laughs> We can move on from periods, I guess. Um, No, it's fascinating. (laughs) And any 
men who are listening to this, you just do not know how easy you had it that you didn't have to both be like a teenager and dealing with something like a period. Just, you just never know. True. <laughs> You'll never know. Okay. So I, I wonder, and this is actually talking to you guys is just reminding me of my youth. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at your love life now versus what you thought it would be like when you were that age, when you were getting your period for the first time, like how does it stack up? Like how does adulthood stack up to your fantasy of what being an adult was going to be like romantically? This is a good one. (laughs) Oh, wow. This is, I, I feel like I was always very much this way, maybe a little bit more romantic or like, um, fantastical in my like thought processes of romance and like what that would look like i definitely thought i'd be like married by like my 20s <laughs> but i think i kind of kicked that pretty early on like late teens but i think i was always a little more like rebellious and not interested in like the norm <laughs> and always like a little bit of a hoe <laughs> <laughs> so like do you remember just like being like i can't wait till i'm like an adult and i can just like go wherever and like meet all kinds of men oh, yeah. and have all kinds of sex with them like was that something you were like <laughs> definitely i mean like i was an early bird in terms of like losing my virginity and like just trying different things and having like sexual experiences but like my mom was crazy not in terms of like my mom didn't care my mom was like if we're gonna have sex like use a condom don't get pregnant don't get an std and like be smart but i we just didn't get along like we're both very intense personalities so like we cannot live under the same roof so when i was like studying for my sats and applying to colleges it was like i am getting into college i'm getting a scholarship so that i can go to college and like party and hook up and like (laughs) amazing (laughs) that was like my motivation not like oh i can't wait to go be like a studious student i was like let's party (laughs) so i think i always had these like fantasies of just like I don't know, but Glenn and I were actually talking about this because we started rewatching Gossip mm-hmm. Girl from the first episode. Quarantine life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I went to private school for my first four years of middle school and we started reading Gossip Girl and it was like a whole different world. So like it definitely like warped my view of maybe relationship and sex and kind of being like a fast ass kid oh my god i i'm i'm sure it did and there's no way that didn't influence you like if you were into that at a young age it's so fascinating like those movies and those tv shows that connect with us that totally then we like that becomes part of like our persona or our perspective or our approach to something you know so interesting Mm -hmm. so interesting glenn how about you Yeah. And I I totally relate to that last part, too. And being from New York, I feel like we were living these like fast lives. So my whole expectation of like what romance and courtship was supposed to be like, I think has been warped. Like I literally thought it was supposed to be like sex in the city going on like fabulous dates and things like that. And I was also like such a romantic thought the other day how there was this website called like girl.com, G-U-R-L. The other one will take you to another kind of website. (laughs) (laughs) And you could, like, make a fake boyfriend on... You could, like, generate a boyfriend. What? You, like, would take this test. Teen Cosmo or Cosmo Girl kind of... Weird. Amazing. Do you want a boy who's going to, like... (laughs) Who's athletic or, like artsy do you want a boy who's gonna do this or do that and then like generate this dude and you could like write messages back and forth like you were talking to the the computer and i would literally i'd be like eight years old talking to my fake computer boyfriend just so (laughs) crazy but like yeah i was always like trying to do this like boyfriendy romantic thing oh my god (laughs) (laughs) listen I know. I'm like, come on, you guys. Let's come on now. Come on now. If I, if the internet had existed when I was eight, I would have had the same thing. Uh, so I do not judge you. <laughs> what the fuck? I've had some experiences. Like I've been out here. I've been in these streets <laughs> over, you know, over this lifetime. Yeah, it happened fast. <laughs> <laughs> So are you still a romantic? I want to hear Chelsea's answer to this question, but I guess, and this is a question I actually have for all of you. Like, so now, you know, being young women in your twenties and you've been through some things and you've seen some things and you've been in these streets and you've had experiences, like, what do you, do you want to get married? Like, is that traditional life and that model of, you know, what it means to be like a successful adult? Like you get married and you have kids and is that at all interesting to you guys anymore? Are you just like, that's so you know, 
I don't know, like boomer. Antiquated. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <So> boomer. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah, no, I am still into it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think my experience was like probably a little different. I I think I've had like three relationships, but they were all like significant. So like literally my first day of high school, basically I got a boyfriend on the quad. I want to talk to you. A week later, we're boyfriend and girlfriend. And obviously that's really young, but you know, first month of college, I got a boyfriend and it was all through college. And then after college, after that relationship, I had like my moments of being a wild gal, probably fucking around with Sade, to be honest. And it was fun. But for me, I think I think I'm just more comfortable dealing with bullshit from people that I actually care about. Like if I don't care about you, it's hard for me to do the like the games. So I, I it's like I'm not good at it, if that makes sense, unless we're in a relationship. Like so is your is your relationship now like is he the one? Yes. Oh wow. Amazing. Yeah. You were an early bloomer. You were like the opposite of me, but I think that's amazing. I wanted to be you, but it just wasn't <laughs> it wasn't in the cards. <laughs> Girls same, Francesca. I was the one like, oh, nobody's going to send me a candy gram on Valentine's Day. A candy Day, gram. Except for my friends. <laughs> like, who's going to deliver it to my classroom? I was every boy's, like, friend. Or they would come to me and be like, yo, how can I get at your girl? <laughs> you think she wants to know? Like, who, who would she like? You, literally. <laughs> oh, my God. This is my life. <laughs> I think the period of like dating a bunch of guys was good because then I was just like, oh, I really know what I hate. I really know what I like. And then I don't know. I just picked it. (laughs) I think I'm still like very much interested in settling down and like having a serious relationship and like kids. But I also feel like sometimes I'm very practical, maybe like too practical. And I just can't envision like being with one person for the rest of my life. If it happens, like amazing and great. But I also could definitely see myself having like many loves. And wait, do you think monogamy is like not practical? Do you know anyone that's been like in a you know, a long-term monogamous relationship? No, not really. I guess my parents, but even my mom, I was gonna say, this is my mom's third marriage. So my like aunts, cousins, like additional family, yeah. But I think that I just love that you can have so many different connections with different types of people. And I would love to be able to kind of explore what that may look like. So maybe it's not necessarily that I'm like in tons of different relationships, but that I'm able to like be poly or like swing or I don't know. So yeah, well, I think it's interesting. You know, I actually have a friend who's my age and she and I have been friends for a really long time. So we've been through a lot of phases together, like running the streets, (laughs) you know, and then being a little bit more settled and whatever. But she came to the realization for herself that she was like, She's been in a lot of relationships and her relationships tend to be like very intense and they're very committed like for the time that they last. And she's like, I love the process of falling in love and being in relationships teaches me so much like every relationship I've been in has taught me like about so many different parts of myself like she just came to the realization she's like I just want to continue having multiple relationships Mm. for the rest of my life Mm. so not to be poly but like one at a time but she just and I'm like she's the only person I know who has actively made that decision but I think it's so smart and I think that there are actually a lot of people for whom that would be actually an ideal model but it's just so Mm -hmm. far from what we are you know like it's so far from what we're like conditioned to think relationships are supposed to look like we either think you need to be like poly or super you know penguins Mm -hmm. mating for life and there's a lot in between that you know yeah that sounds so healthy and also i mean so that means you you date someone and then you become comfortable with the fact that like it's run its course and you don't feel like yes. you need to hold on to it or you're not like drunk to your ex. <laughs> it's like you interesting statement part Lynn. ways like that's I know girl I know <laughs> yes Glenn to say more <laughs> this is a hot hot mess y'all. oh god I've talked about this on our show but I've had this tumultuous relationship with someone actually when I met Francesca we had just gotten out of something very heated and my dumb ass texted him last night and that's why I haven't been drinking oh my god you today. admitted it oh <laughs> it last night 
Lord. So what it was very much like, how are you doing? Are you healthy? So it, it reminded me of those like future me. Yeah. Like, are you, I hope you're good. You don't have to answer to this. You don't have to reply to this message. I just want to make sure you're feeling safe and healthy. Like, so you're like the future meme. Toxic. Toxic texter. It's a future meme. Exactly. <laughs> did you did he respond? Yes. So, so this was on Instagram and he's been blocked on all everything. He was blocked on Instagram, too. But sometimes I look at his page from our Instagram, uh, Black Girls Texting's page, and he had posted this picture of him doing yoga and smiling. And I was like, oh, my God, he actually looks really healthy and happy. So then I unblocked him and I and you wanted to ruin it. No, watch this. Mm. I unblocked him and then I saw in his stories, he's like, I've been making fire Spotify playlists during quarantine. Hit me up if you want one. So then we were talking about being healthy or whatever. And then I was out of nowhere. This is how you know I was just like out of my mind. I'm like, send me a Spotify <laughs> playlist. Like what? Lord. <laughs> he's like, I sent it to you. Did you get it? I'm like, no. He's like, oh, I texted it to you. Unblock me. I can't see do this oh, is how you know no. y'all are fucked up. The fact that he this knows that so you're bad. he's blocked and he has to say unblock me for me to send you something. It's so ridiculous. I'm not going to reply. I'm not replying. <laughs> and he's, he's staying blocked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You just got to block them. You know what, though? I actually, I have a lot of empathy for this situation because social media has made it so hard to really just let your exes be in the past. Yes. Yeah. Like, yes, I totally agree. You should block them. But even the fact that you can't unblock them, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> like They don't just go away. I, like I can think about like the relationship that I was in that was my like super tumultuous relationship when I was in my 20s. And when I finally like reached my breaking point with that, I was like, I was able to literally just like cut him out of my life because, you know, it, you know, there was like MySpace, Friendster, but it wasn't a culture of like everyone being on social media and sharing so much of their lives. So it was so easy for me to just like totally cut <laughs> him out. And I know, I know myself well enough to know because I am just kind of a natural stalker. <laughs> like... <laughs> Like one of my friends who knows me since we were 13, she's like, she says that I invented stalking. She's like, you used to stalk people before the internet. So like, I don't know Stop how you it. did it. I'm like, it's true. I was good. <laughs> oh my God. So I know that if I had had as done as I was with that relationship, when I got out of it, you know, when I was like, I don't know, 28 or 29, I know that if I had had Instagram and I had had, you know, a history of seeing him on Instagram and seeing what he posted on Instagram, it would have been really, would have made it a lot harder. Definitely. No, totally. I've been wondering like, yes. what's worse for your ex to be blocked yes. and not have any access to your life and not even be able to see you a little bit. Does that make them like stir and stew at home and be like, oh, I can't see their face. Or do you leave them unblocked and just stunt <laughs> and live your life and be just like so cute and happy and then they it hurts see but that's it's rooted in like some type of need for them to feel away. Like I feel like in the two relationships that I've had that were like super serious, I never felt like I needed to like be like, you're blocked and you don't have access to me, mwahaha, or like look at me on the gram, you know? It depends how you break up. I feel like if you have like a, a nasty end you could feel some type of way without yeah. like caring about them or like wanting them back or caring if they look at you it's just like yeah. fuck this person this human See, being i don't like nasty you know? ends though like don't you feel like you should like mend the nasty ends yeah i don't like nasty ends but sometimes it gets nasty True. yeah it is what it is i mean shade i agree with you that look like, like the goal is that you have moved on and even no matter how it ended you've released it like you've released it you've you know you've forgiven the person you've forgiven the situation and just because just for the sake of your own peace and then you move on and then you don't care whether they see you or not and that's not a thought in your head that is the goal absolutely and the more that you can work towards that goal the better but i think in general though it's better just to block because if you i think if so. you have if you're letting somebody first of all if you're doing something kind of like if you're being sort of performative like okay now oh wait I look cute let me post this picture so he can be like damn you know like then you're adding this layer of like filter or motivation to your life that's like just taking away your own authenticity in a way because now it's mm -hmm. about what, how somebody's going to respond versus what you just genuinely and authentically how you just genuinely and authentically want to express yourself you know yeah I mean that's the whole problem with social media in general 
Yeah. Right. How much do you guys struggle with that just in general with social media? I mean, you, you know, you're all obviously like you're out there, you have followings, you have people who are really paying attention to what you do and what you say. And how much are you able to just kind of put the opinions of people out of your minds and, you know, just really be yourselves? Mm, Yeah, I feel like Social media gives me extreme anxiety. Like I'll post a picture just because I feel like, oh, I haven't posted something in a long time. And then if I start getting likes and comments, I can't even like look at them. It's really weird. And it feels like a job for me to go in and like reply to them and stuff. So I kind of, I I don't know. I think I keep my engagement kind of low. I find the social media to be like very noisy. So I don't, I don't know. So even like the the part of myself that I show is like pretty polished and it's like, okay, people are going to get hit like on this, but like, yeah. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. No, it totally makes sense. I mean, that I think that's really common. I think uh, I think that most people have some level of social media anxiety. Shade, what about you? I'm a cliche Leo. I like attention. <laughs> so usually <laughs> I, if I'm posting something, it's like provocative. And I just like want to like show off my outfit or my body on like the posts. Mm. <laughs> I've started doing this weird thing that Glenn is like, why are you doing this? <laughs> I will like post something at like a weird time and then I archive it and then I repost it again. So like it never shows on anyone's like feed. Oh, interesting. But then if you like go onto my page, you can see it. Oh, okay. That's an Instagram hack. I didn't know yeah, about that's that. that's interesting. Very weird. Because I don't want like, like I have a picture, like it's like a lot of boobs and I like love it. I think it's super cute, but I don't want it like in the feed like, oh my God, Jenny's tits are like out, but I like how it mm. looks. Yeah. So like, if you like come to my page, you can come and see it and it's super cute, but it's not like popping up in your feed, like in your face. I don't know, whatever. See, I want to collect my likes. After I said all that I just said, I still want, I like when them likes roll in. I don't look at them, but I'm like, oh my goodness, just, there's a bunch of stuff on my screen. <laughs> yeah, if you post a picture and it doesn't get likes, that's kind of... I don't ew. like it. <laughs> yeah. See, I like it. It feels nice, but at the same time, it doesn't like matter as much to me as much as I just like the The flow of like the feed and like how i the aesthetic yeah i like the aesthetic because mostly a lot of it is like me thirst trapping so (laughs) uh, like i like go onto someone's page and like like a bunch of their photos or like i'm trying to get like instagram attention they come on and they're like oh this bitch is cute (laughs) but my stories like anything goes i love just like being crazy and a lot of people really dislike my stories because they're really annoying and unnecessary but (laughs) that's where i probably have my most fun amazing yeah, I think, um, I don't know. No, it's so fascinating. I think one, well, one piece of advice that I always have for people, if you are if you do have a lot of social media anxiety or you find yourself getting very like attached to how many likes you got or not, is to make sure that you have notifications turned off on your phone. Oh, yeah. So at least you're not just constantly, constantly either like being reminded by how many likes you're getting or being reminded by how many likes you're not getting. Hmm. That's like my one piece of advice. But I I mean, I consider myself to be someone who's very, in general, like I'm pretty detached from people's opinions of me, which is not, certainly was not the case, I don't know, probably not even 10 years ago, much less before that. But even I will like, sometimes I'm just like, really people? Like, why Like why are you even following me if you don't even like what I post? Yeah, some people are just nosy. Sometimes I'm like, God, like I'm like, my father just don't like me oh like, <laughs> like people so I definitely have that feeling sometime and it's not like it's you know it's not to the point it's like my godsons they're so funny because they'll be like if they post a photo and it gets within like 15 minutes if it doesn't have at least like 200 likes they delete it because they're like that's oh just embarrassing right <laughs> Wait, how old are oh they? Oh my gosh. They're 19 yeah, now. My cousins yeah. get thousands of likes mm. on all of their pictures. And it's just like people and I don't even know who these people That's are. That's crazy. Like, they don't, like, yeah. they don't do, the, my cousins are not like public figures. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a teenager thing. It's because what it is, is like every kid in their school, like it, you just basically like everyone's photo. Ah. Like just as a matter of just yes. practice. And so if they don't just do the thing that they always do, then it means they're really like, oh, fuck you. That was wet. I've watched my little cousin on Instagram and she just like scrolls and likes and like I'm kind of a bitch I don't like something unless like Absolutely. I actually like it yeah I only like it unless I actually like it or unless it's a friend of mine like somebody I really care about in which yeah, case yeah, I'll yeah. just I like I'll all just my friends support stuff. them but like yeah but that's why so if they don't get hundreds of likes on their photos they're just like this is like no this is embarrassing <laughs> like so mortified I was like oh good thing you're not me <laughs> <'Cause> you... <laughs> but I think you know social media that's just 
just the challenge of it is like we all have to kind of navigate our relationship with it and and just notice like pay attention to the light that it's shining on how we view ourselves you know absolutely i was going to say one thing shade loves to do is to slide in dms and (laughs) well that's not how i met my boyfriend we met in person but we met very briefly and then we went our separate ways. And I like, I just feel like I want to keep talking to this guy. And because I'm a stalker. You stalked him down and you found his page. <laughs> I stalked him and yes. <laughs> yes, I totally stalked him. And I was like, I just, I found him and I followed him. Cause I was like, okay, he's either going to be like, okay, how did she find me? <laughs> She's crazy. <laughs> right or he's gonna be psyched so he oh followed God, me right back it. so i was like okay Great good sign. he's psyched good sign good sign and then i slid into his dms and i just said hey it was really nice meeting you and that was it because mm-hmm. i was like i've done enough work Boom. now like if he's not motivated enough to like pick up the ball and run with it then this is not happening but he was i love so it so i'm a fan of sliding into the dms that's i have that's never modern done love. That. <laughs> i've never done that that would give me so much anxiety i think not even like a celeb or like no i'm not talking really to high. a celeb that. that's weird they're not gonna respond <laughs> i mean you never know uh-huh you'd be surprised well i wouldn't even want them to respond no 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 i've never done that <laughs> but the way how you did it i would like that like you were just like you weren't like being quote unquote thirsty about it you're just like hey if you want to talk to me here i am i made it easier for you to find me yeah now the ball's in your court exactly So I'm all about like, I'm not, I've never been really a pursuer of men. Really? Well, I, there were times when I was never turned out well. It's not, it's not not right for me. (laughs) Do you guys know about human design? No. No. Okay. Oh, that's a whole other conversation. All right. We'll do that the next time. And and then I'm (laughs) curious. We do another interview. Basically, it's a system that is, it's a combination of a lot of other different systems like traditional astrology, the Chinese I Ching, um, chakra system, the tree of life. And it basically, it takes, it goes by your date and time and place of birth. So similar to astrology, but then it so it generates a chart and it's basically the blueprint of your energy. Like it's how you were designed, like optimally designed to operate, like oh, how you're designed to make decisions, how you're designed to use your energy it gets very 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 specific i'm a very big fan of human design but everyone in human design is one of five different energy types and my energy type is called the projector and with projectors our life strategy what it says in human design is that we're supposed to wait for the invitation so we are not supposed to be the people who pursue things we are supposed to be the people who make ourselves visible like hi here i am this is what i'm about and then wait for people to come to us interesting and that sounds like enneagrams in a way but it's not because but enneagrams have way more there's like nine or something yeah well in human design so there's five different energy types but the chart itself gets really specific so there's two billion potential combinations of a human design chart oh my gosh (laughs) so it gets like incredibly incredibly specific (laughs) oh lord i didn't even know about human design when i met my boyfriend but when i learned about it and i was like oh that makes sense because when i think back on my relationships the ones where i was really the one who was like trying to make it happen and i was like going after him and i was like i'm gonna win this guy over that never worked it was always a struggle and only in the ones where i was just like i allowed myself to be pursued those were the ones that were always the best relationships like not even close well do you guys believe i know like a lot of women of a different generation might say this that like the man should always want you more in a heterosexual relationship i mean my mom always said that growing up did your mom say that too chelsea because i'm like yeah she always they said that. were reading from the uh, same book first the tampons and then that first right that <laughs> old school mama <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I don't think that it should be like that for the whole relationship. I feel like once you start getting with each other, then it becomes like equal. But I think for the beginning, for me, like it's always been better when the guy's like obsessed Mm. with me. What a lot of people say is that you should be with somebody who loves you more than you love them. Yeah. Um, That's what a lot of women get that message. I totally disagree with that. And I think that I understand the thought process behind it, but I also think that that's like not the kind of relationship that I personally want to have. I think I agree you know it's because it's almost like it's coming to a relationship like from a place Mm. of fear of like oh the only way this is gonna last is if 
you know, he loves me Wait, more. Wait, but isn't, isn't that the same thing? Like them approaching you? No. So that's the relationship. But in terms of, in terms of courtship, for whatever reasons, and, and actually, I mean, and I don't want to talk too much about human design. I think for, for talking about heterosexual couples, but for most heterosexual women, it is a better strategy to let the man pursue you because of just the typical relationship dynamic where men are more likely to like more likely to value people experiences you know relationships that that you had to put a little bit of work Mm -hmm. into right like if it happens like you know it's kind of like with lottery winners like most people who win the lottery Mm. go bankrupt within like two years right and but most people who like are born in poverty and like you know work their whole lives to become millionaires like they don't lose that money yeah that makes sense (laughs) you know so i think it is a similar thing but i think but i think but beyond like kind of like who's pursuing who it's just a matter of like you just want to make sure that somebody has a lot of enthusiasm for you yeah which is how i interpreted that saying yeah and so it's like if you're the one who's like having to constantly be like hey want to hang out hey da 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 how's it going da da or like oh i'm just gonna shoot in this text and it's gonna be really cool i'm just no big deal (laughs) then you're just you're settling for somebody who's not demonstrating that enthusiasm for you you know so that is what I think that's what I always want women to make sure that you are. I'm not trying to like say be demure and play games. I'm not about that, like game playing. But it's like give this man a chance to step up and show that he has the enthusiasm and the availability and the willingness to actually pursue you and pursue a relationship with you. Yeah, I agree. See, I'm always the pursuer because I like to just go after what I want. I find that in the different scenarios that I've had, a lot of guys are a little bit reluctant and then the feedback I get is like they're intimidated. Yeah. Or like yeah. they're like, oh, I didn't think like you really would talk to me or I didn't think you would really like spend time with me. I thought you were just like whatever. I, a lot of times I would probably meet them like drunk and crazy. Oh, like they think it's just so a, like, like sex thing. Or like a just like a one time thing. Like I've gotten that so many times. Like, oh, I didn't think you were really interested in me. And I'm like, what the mm. fuck? <laughs> you know, it could be. Um, and I think we had a similar conversation when I was on your podcast. But, you know, it could just be that you are. There's something about the way that you are approaching them that doesn't feel special enough. Ooh. If you think about like the essence of flirting is making another person feel seen, special, acknowledged. And so mm. when, and we all know this because you know the difference between the dude who's hitting on every woman who walks by. I'm that guy. That's true. <laughs> I was going to say, right? you say how you pick these guys up. If you're, what if your the dude who's is. hitting on every single woman that walks by, he's just playing a numbers game. I'm he's like, guy. hey, you'll do, you'll do, you'll do. You know, that's the message you get, right? Versus the guy who's like, I don't normally do this, but I had to come talk to you. Mm. That's a line. And but I mean, even saying that, but you can just feel that energy and like you're like, this is not a guy who is talking yeah. to every woman in this place, you know. So I sh- so Sade, what I would say to you is probably the guys that are resistant to that are probably guys who are probably looking for something more serious when a man is looking and women, too. But like when a heterosexual man is looking for a relationship and I just defaulting to this hetero dynamic because that's what we all are and not to be exclusive, I'm not trying to exclude anyone, but he's looking for a safe place for his heart and if you're coming to the relationship oh my god already (laughs) sending the message that he's not special that's not a message that anyone wants to receive who's actually looking for (gasps) oh my god so my first date with like the guy i'm talking to again we got so drunk and we started talking and i was like yeah like i don't believe in monogamy i feel like it's so unrealistic it's like not a real thing and like every fight we would get into before we broke up was like well, you don't even believe in monogamy <laughs> oh yeah see <laughs> and i was like fuck oh my god it's coming to bite me in the ass so <laughs> but can't you find someone because you don't believe in monogamy right i will be monogamous if that is what my partner wants but i think like with time i We'll have to see how I'm feeling and adjust and pivot. Because I feel like you could meet someone who probably feels that same way. I've been, I don't have a problem, I think, being monogamous, but I also don't, if that's like like a non-negotiable with the person that I'm with. But I am very clear, I think, about the fact that like, it's not my ideal. I think that there are 
a lot of attractive people out there. I don't want to say not my ideal, but just like not what I would default to. But like, that's one of the things that I think I'm willing to kind of compromise on for however long that relationship Hmm. lasts. Interesting. Well, you know what? I think knowing yourself and you know you're young and you'll continue to have experiences and just stay open because i know people who are very much like committed to non-monogamy they really feel that's how they're hardwired you know and i'm not necessarily hearing that from you i almost hear more of like a skepticism that you could meet somebody where you two would want to be together for the long term would you agree with that Ooh, yeah i could see that I just like, I'm a little yeah. impulsive and I, I act on impulse and attraction and the immediate, I think. If someone can keep me occupied, then maybe <laughs> that's a different story, but. Well, you know what? Know. It's all, it's all part of your journey and you'll figure it out if you want to, right? If you want to like start to get curious about it, that's like my advice for everyone. If there's just something that you're like, I don't know, like, I don't know why I do this, or I don't know if this or not. Just like, just get curious about it. If you just start asking yourself, like, hmm, why am I so impulsive? Like, what, what's that about? Or what do I really think? is possible for me in terms of a relationship like do I even believe that it's possible for me you know what's what's going on here with my feelings about monogamy just to ask yourself questions without judgment and you'll start to get more and more insights it's just my general advice about anything that you're kind of trying to figure out but also just be gentle with yourself and you know with time things will come more clear I wonder why there is so much judgment like in terms of like relationship styles yeah. you know like even judging yourself or like other people you know a monog- person who believes in monogamy being like ew you're gross if you want to be poly and poly people being like you're boring or <laughs> brainwashed <laughs> unrealistic if you want to be like if you want to fall in love with one person so like what does that come from like why can't people just mind their business I think it comes from a very long human history of relationships and marriage specifically being very transactional and then evolving to a time where we started wanting to treat it as something romantic instead of transactional, but it became in a lot of cases just like total cognitive dissonance, like denial, like, oh, I just happen to like, this person is really perfect for me. And they happen to be practically like, you know, this, that or the other, or, you know, whatever, like, just if you look at marriage, historically, it's been very transactional. And it's only a pretty recent development that we started to really feel like, oh, our partner needs to be our best friend and the best sex we ever had. And we have to have like all the same interests and, blah, 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 and like all of these other things and the same level of education and income and ambition and like so many layers that are very unrealistic in some ways because you're looking for a perfect ideal rather than understanding that a relationship is about two people coming together open-hearted with a real like commitment to working through your differences and building a life together and so people you know if you look at like weddings for instance like there's so many people and you know the most dysfunctional couple so much drama so much misery but like on their wedding day it's a quote-unquote fairy tale and then they're married Mm -hmm. and they're miserable and so they start producing projecting onto everyone else, which is what we all do. We all project like, you know, Mm -hmm. our own views. I think it's just about projection. That's all. People not being comfortable and owning their own choices Mm -hmm. and their own relationships. And so they judge other people's as a way to like make themselves feel better about their own choices, whatever that choice may be, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have one more question for you ladies, because I could talk to you all night, but I want to respect your time. And so this is a question that I ask everyone who comes on the podcast and whatever your answer is, there's no wrong answer. So, because sometimes people feel pressured, but don't feel pressure. If you had a megaphone that was loud enough for the whole world to hear and you could send out one message about love, what would that message be? That is a deep question. Um, I guess that love, although there may be like difficult times and like hard times and I don't believe in like a puzzle piece perfect batch I think love is like fun Ooh. at the end of the day I just my boyfriend and I were sitting here watching like old videos of us on vacation and I literally started tearing up because I'm like that was so fun I want to go back <laughs> but then even in the house like we're like play fighting and wrestling and it's like also fun like but we have our moments that are difficult but at the end of the day it's fun can i just say that i've asked so many people this question and no one has ever said fun so i just love that answer that is so cool oh my god chelsea that was so cute i'm obsessed i guess i would say (laughs) when it comes to love everyone is worthy of it and deserves it 
in some way. I love Ooh, that I love so that. much. Preach. Yes, yes. <laughs> Shade, how about you? These are not my lines. These belong to RuPaul Charles. <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love anybody else? Yes, amen to that. I love that you quoted RuPaul. And very quickly, I once ran into RuPaul at the Grand Canyon. Stop it. <gasps> How was that? Oh my God, God. that would lose my fucking mind. Of all places. It was amazing. He, Did he have on like the best outfit ever? Just chilling. Like, like a man was, visiting the Grand Canyon. Right. But he's so distinctive. You can't oh. not know it's RuPaul, you yeah. know? I'm not very interested in celebrities and I wouldn't normally do this, but I was like, it's RuPaul. So like, I have to say something. And so, yeah, so we took a picture. Like him and his friend and me and my friend who I was with, we all four took a picture. He was so lovely. <gasps> Incredible. Aww. My God. Oh my God, I could... I literally love RuPaul so much. He is a very lovely human. So yeah. Anyway, if you ever run into him, he's very nice. <laughs> Maybe you guys will have him on the podcast oh, one oh, day. That would be yes. fun. <gasps> you should do it. that. I'm I'm gonna hold that I space for that. you guys. I see it. <laughs> I see it. Yes. Uh, well, thank you so much, ladies. My one final question, and I'm gonna, of course, in the show notes, I'm gonna link to to Black Girls Texting to the interview that you guys did with me of Black Girls Texting and your social media, but is there anything else that you want listeners to know that you're working on or to pay attention to? And uh, Yeah, definitely the podcast. Yeah, go ahead, Chelsea. I was going to say, it comes out every Wednesday, Black Girls Texting on Instagram, and tune in. I love talking to you. Oh, yay. <laughs> so good. Our Instagram is Black Girls Texting. Our website is blackgirlstexting.com. And if you want to shoot us an email, it's hello at blackgirlstexting.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, ladies. Stay safe and stay healthy. And yes, uh, I'll be talking to you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 And there you have it, my conversation with Glenn and Sade and Chelsea. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did. (laughs) And be sure to check the show notes for links to Black Girls Texting and to their social media and also to the episode that I did on their podcast, which like mentioned at the beginning is a good one if I did say so myself. And um, also in the show notes, you can find links to my social media. I am at Dear Franny on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, etc. And the podcast is at Dear Franny Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Please do reach out. Join me on Sundays for as long as this quarantine lasts. I am going to be doing, and maybe beyond, but at least for as long as the quarantine lasts, I am hosting virtual sound baths every Sunday live on my Instagram. So you are welcome to join that. Invite your friends. It's been really fun and a real nice experience of relaxation and also community because it's really cool to see people joining and have that nice meditative experience together. So you can find that on my Instagram. Thank you to those of you who have taken time to subscribe to this podcast. If you are enjoying it, please do leave us a five-star review. Be very grateful. Or a five-star rating. That's one thing. You could do that in just one tap. And then if you feel inclined to also write a review, that's amazing too. Thanks for those who've taken the time to do that. I definitely read them and I am very grateful. So thank you very much. And also in the show notes, there's some options that I have right now for coaching including pay what you can sessions. If you want to do a session and you are worried about money, don't be. I am more than happy to talk to you about your love or life challenge, whatever is pressing on your mind and you want some brainstorming help with. So links to that in the show notes as well. So wherever you are in the world, I am very grateful for you taking the time to listen to the show. And if you think that the show is great and you want to support it, please, like I said, share it, rate it, review it, subscribe. And Um, even if you don't, I still appreciate you. So stay healthy, stay safe until next time.